Um, so this morning um, we're in for a treat, how to build a world-class company and international leaders through understanding and managing diversity. I think that's a good idea, <laughs> be one of us. Um, so I will give you just the brief uh, bio on the um, program. As consultant to FTSE 100 companies and previously manager of Global Diversity Network, which is a knowledge sharing forum of global heads of diversity, including a very impressive um, who's who like Barclays, BP, Cable and Wireless, Dow Chemicals, HP, etc., etc. Uh, Tess will examine the crucial role of HR processes. Uh, for example, performance management, uh, defining competencies, recruitment, training and development, employee um, engagement and so on, uh, in promoting a safe, inclusive and productive work environment, which sounds like the best sort to have. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you've um, heard Tess on, in previous sessions, so um, I'm sure we're going to enjoy this all this very much. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see you all here. Um, in the keynote presentation that I did on um, Wednesday, I mentioned uh, that uh, human resources has a pivotal role to play in converting the, all the rhetoric that we've heard into reality, um, be it performance management, training and development, policies, uh, scrutinising them, uh, etc. Um, so I see this morning as an opportunity to drill down and look at some of the case studies that I gave you a, a glimpse of uh, on Wednesday in more detail um, to get underneath some of the, the issues that we highlighted. Good morning. Welcome. Um, also, I'm very mindful of the fact that the last couple of days you've been talked at quite a lot. Um, by experts about different things. But I firmly believe that, A, I'm not an expert, but uh, if I am, then we all are. Uh, and I believe that all of you in this room have got uh, a whole uh, gamut of experience, and I really, really like to draw on that um, in this, in this uh, next hour. Uh, and I see, I see this morning as sort of not so much throwing lots more input at you. There would be some, obviously. But I'm going to use this as an opportunity for a more interactive um, session, if you like, an, an opportunity after the past two days, full-on days, to pause, reflect, process some of the stuff that's, uh, that's come out of that. Um, were, you, were, you, were you all here for Wednesday? For, you're all aware of the definition of what diversity is, basically, inclusion. That's great. Okay. So moving... Actually, before we move straight in, good morning. There's really that, not that many of us, so can we just briefly just say your name so we know who, who, who's in the room, what organisation you're from, and that's it, just two pieces of information, that'd be really nice. Who'd like to kick off? Good morning. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Great, thanks very much. Very significant, I sense. Yes, thank you. Oh, absolutely, and to us, thank you. <laughs> Simon? Uh, Simon, uh, Simon Robinson from Melbourne Cares, Australia, Australia. Thanks, Simon. I'm Janet Lee from Melbourne Strangle. Thanks, Janet. I'm Julie Pollard from the Melbourne Strangle. Thank you. Joanne Costello from Equilibrium Barry, Brisbane. Welcome. Lucy Brown from Northcott. Thanks, Lucy. Just helping and supporting. You've been the backbone of everything that's been going on here. You've been fabulous, James. Thank you for joining us. Um, kicking off with some of the... Uh, I'm not sure I showed this image, actually, um, on Wednesday. Yeah, that's right. So this is, I think I did show this image um, on Wednesday. I'm sure you remember it. Um, initial, what I did, sorry? It's pretty memorable. It's pretty memorable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, what I didn't have a, an opportunity to do on Wednesday was ask you what your reactions are, were seeing that. So just immediate reactions when you, when you saw that and see it now. What kind of things 
hit you. Astonishment. Sex sells to men. Sex sells to men, yeah. Uh, uh, laughable first and then disgusted. Laughable then disgusted, yeah. Similar actually, sort of stereotypical but shocking. Yes. And, and actually, no one would actually do that. Yeah, I can't believe anyone did it. Yeah, yeah. The sexy and dirty. Uh, oh, they've proudly put their, their brand on the bottom. So I can tell you, it was uh, B- Bowie Castle Bank uh, Limited. Um, that that appears in Personnel Today. An uh, in industry, yeah. Absolutely, that's an industry uh, newspaper, which I, I think was particularly shocking. Uh, if you see it in other distributions like The Economist or the FT, it's almost, you know, uh, to be expected, equally shocking, but to be expected. But to find it in uh, an industry uh, outlet was particularly... And it, it speaks to me volumes about really where we are um, on the subject. And this is a, you know, HR industry newspaper. And, it, and there were no complaints, like, other than me, obviously. Um, so it's, it's like, and that, that, that was the point that I alluded to on Wednesday. If you see one thing, even as, as, as in your face as these, on its own, we don't notice them. We just flick through the pages and we don't notice them, but they go in subliminally. The messages go in subliminally. Just to uh, let you, t- so that you're aware, the uh, weapons of mass distraction will go into more detail in the marketing um, stream because that was... Uh, uh, a marketing blunder, if you like, but it had ramifications for the HR department because it was approved, apparently, by the HR department. Um, and this is an EasyJet um, uh, advertisement that was sent out. And it was used in The Economist <coughs> uh, to mock uh, uh, sex, the whole sex sales mentality. So they were uh, really hauled over the coals co- co- as a company and the ASA uh, forced them to remove it. Um, what about this? These two. What kind of reactions do you have looking at those? If it, just so as you can read that this one was for Lloyd's TSB, and these are all recent; they're not sort of old. Um, and the job is for trying to get people in, into the bank. Picture of a, a young rugby guy. It's not having your eyebrows shaved off by the lads at the union bar. Blokey, yeah. There's nothing to appeal there for a young woman. Nothing to appeal there for a young woman. No way that a young woman would relate to better. No. In fact, it would probably be a young woman not. Absolutely. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Really good point. Absolutely. If you're not one of those uh, uh, sporty, blokey, rugby guys, why would you... Absolutely. It gives a very clear... It's very, very specific, isn't it? It's almost writing out a job description of the kind of person they want. Um, And the, the... these advertisements do have an impact. And then organisations like Lloyd's TSB, who do have a very good track record in diversity, who have a very strong diversity department, and an ad like that completely undermines it. And when I speak to the people in the diversity departments, they're absolutely mortified because they don't know. They don't know that this has appeared. They haven't seen it. It's released by their marketing department or by a HR department, approved by HR department, but the diversity people didn't know about it. So the alignment is absolutely crucial that we get this into the, into the, the backbone of the organisation. What about these? It's all about white men. This one reads here, thought leader, problem solver, difference maker. And that particular one, all the others were job advertisements. This one was for uh, MBA. What what representation do you have of women on MBA courses here in Australia? Yeah. Well, in the AFR, yesterday, it is it's higher than in the UK, but uh, in the AFR yesterday, last night I came across a piece that said it's uh, 30%. Yeah. 
and in some institutions, probably these ones, uh, very little, 10%. Okay, I think that was just a bit of a taster, um, and I already made the point um, on Wednesday that all those images that I showed serve cumulatively to create a certain kind of environment, um, uh, and the HR department in releasing advertisements like that plays a pivotal role in sourcing talent for the organisation, not just with the images, but with the language, the words, what's in the subtext underneath that? What kind of person are they looking for? What kind of language do they use? Is it very masculine, macho language? Or is it more inclusive language? Does it stipulate that you have to have seven years unbroken experience, for example, in a particular role, which may exclude certain people who've taken well, women to take care of children or, or, or men who want to do other things and have taken a career break? So. What do we do? What does the HR department do that undermines um, this whole area? This is something I just want you to, to, to think about, and then we'll, have, we'll come back and have some more, more input, certainly from my perspective, some principles again for success. But what, for now, what I'd really like you to think about, just briefly, uh, how you would leverage, uh, how the HR department could leverage diversity and inclusion in order to really make your company um, effective, specifically with regard to the following areas, because this is the, 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 the bread and butter of the uh, HR department. Performance management processes. How could this be utilised to leverage to improve that within your organisation? Policies and procedures. What kind of things do you need to talk about? When you switch your diversity and inclusion radar on, what kind of things do you then need to go and look for that you mightn't have otherwise seen in your policies and procedures? What about your recruitment? That's been, probably been made easy for you because we've just shown some of, uh, case examples of that. But again, try and draw out of those some principles. Um, okay, this is, if I'm going back to my HR department, I'd say, okay, this is generally what we should do and this is generally what we really shouldn't do because we don't want to uh, be in Tess Finchley's next presentation. Um, training and development. What kind of things do you need to think about there um, in the HR department? Who gets access? You know, uh, uh, over where where, do, where does your training and development take place? Off-site, overnight, you know, that kind of place. Think about those things just briefly. I'm going to get you. There's enough of us now to have two subgroups, <laughs> which is fabulous. <laughs> so I'm just going to get you two, three, four, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we've got six. So can we just go, Julie, do you mind joining this side of the room here? So we've got six here, and then we've got six here, and then briefly just discuss, maybe take a couple of notes, somebody take a designated person, take notes, just for five minutes, and then we'll come back and debrief. Okay, sorry. Um, I know I set you a, a very unfair task, gave you far too much to do and far too little time. So apologies for that. Being an Irish Catholic, I won't sleep tonight for, for guilt. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, I did hear some very interesting discussions, and in the true spirit of diversity, you deviated from the script anyway. So um, <laughs> who'd like to just share some of the nuggets that you were coming up with, some great stories. Of course, stories from your own experiences, which were great. So who'd like to share one? On the performance management, just starting, we, we um, discussed... Uh, that the employees need to be very much involved, so it's all about um, consultation, asking the employees how they can improve and, and what sort of measures need to be put in place for them rather than imposing anything upon them. Yeah. Um, and recognise that different people achieve outcomes in different ways, so there's no, you know, there's no one size fits all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Absolutely. Okay. Over here? <laughs> We have got an easier one actually, we went through recruitment because we were. Ah, okay. Um, well, if I pick one and then you can add two. <laughs> <laughs> we came up with about three or four things, and um, I guess the first one was around the fact that the employer brand needs to be really tightly aligned to the company brand when you choose images and style of headlines and advertisements. Absolutely. Mm. Even if you're using an external organisation like a recruitment. Mm. to go in and advertise for you under their name, mm. still the impact and the impression relates directly back to you. Absolutely, around. yes. Um, so we talked a little around, you know, sort of filter systems that would need to be in place internally to, to 
check before and after because you press and your organization three different Oh really? That's excellent practice. I come from a very small, you know, the organizations I work with, the biggest one might have two hundred staff. Right. Um, Right. That's that's just great practice, really. That's it's, it's a real health check safety. It's a real sort of Six Sigma approach to HR, isn't it? Really? Yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you. Any anything else from over here? Yeah, just the, the, the process itself and the wording within the, the advertisements, uh, the process in terms of the interview and the, the evaluation. Um, the yeah. Yeah, what about the processes in the interview and evaluation? What do you need to think about? Filtering, filtering them, exactly. As well. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I, I, the other interesting thing I've I, I talked about, um, I see a lot of ads that actually go the other way that look like they're trying to offer diversity, they actually get so specific that people um, are discouraged from applying. Mm. Maybe they don't have an interest in the sport. It might be a sporting association that's mm. advertising something. Mm. Somebody who's terribly interested in cycling would be highly regarded. Mm. They actually put up everybody else who's got no interest in cycling, but they might actually go to the position. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's about wording those sorts of things mm. really and just building the organisations or um, indigenous organisations yep. can, can suffer the same. Mm. It doesn't mean you're not looking for someone with a, a genuine understanding and right. uh, being able to acknowledge that, yep. but it's how it's mm. and yep. how it's portrayed. Yep. That so being neutral to it to make sure that uh, you're not excluding any any anyone from it, any talent pool. Okay. Anything else? Exactly. You don't. Absolutely. It conjures up your own stereo, unconscious stereotypes and prejudice. Absolutely. That's a practice that we have in the UK. Is it? Is it a practice here? Sometimes. David, you wanted to make a point? I, I just wanted to make a point that um, really so many times within organisations, the departments are given, there's a lot of territorialism, mm. um, HR territorial territorialism. Yep. So this is HR's job, and mm. that's it, you know, and, and, and that culture um, pervades to the extent that, that actually HR would be paranoid and say, look, we're not giving. There's other members of staff that uh, some of our, I guess, power. Yeah. The word I'm using. Mm. Um, and what that reflects is um, an organisation that's very segmented, that isn't thinking yeah. as an organisation, that's just thinking of, as a little group of yeah. departments. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, in order for HR to have leverage, mm. it's actually an issue beyond HR. Mm. HR should be driving that. Mm. Should be should be steering where those conversations are going, but actually it, it, it does involve other departments, other people. Yes. You know, like it, what I'm saying is the HR practice, the administration of HR yeah. needs to be diverse in its thinking. Absolutely. As well as in its application. Yes. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There is a sense of territory, and uh, as a profession, sometimes feeling validated in an organisation, and you do that by holding on to this. This is your turf. This is your territory, and actually, yeah, for this to work effectively, you've got to let go. You've got to let go of that and work with and educate different uh, departments. But also, you mentioned putting the safeguards in place. That that's important too. Any other points from that? Just, just around the recruitment piece, and it, it's kind of come out indirectly, but from my point of view, I also see it's really important to get the right people doing the interviewing who are representative of where you want to be, so that they're not all white middle aged men doing the interview. Crucial, yeah. Because, particularly in the graduate population, our experience is that graduates will look to see who they meet, they will, or even to that company, 
Mm. It's so key to get the right people out there, yeah. representative, yes. how you want to be. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's a really, really good point that we're going to look at um, in a minute when we look at best practice principles. Uh, and these are just some principles that I've sort of garnered going through this process with um, HR departments. Um, and, and, and some of this you know, will be sort of um, fairly, fairly obvious. Um, but for a HR department trying to do this, uh, to leverage it in an organisation, uh, really have to get your, your, your allies and sponsors at the top of the organisation first. You really do have to start at the top of the organisation and not shy away from that. Um, the kind of examples we have uh, in diversity and inclusion, where it works, bless you, where it works, people um, have done that very successfully. BP. John Brown, whenever he makes a, a public appearance anywhere, he'll mention diversity. Now, and, and the fact is, in reality, he actually puts um, a lot behind that. They have done a great deal of work with regard to cultural diversity, for example. Um, I think they, they've got a lot of work to do, and they, they acknowledge this themselves at uh, senior level with regard to diversity. But cer they've certainly done, even at senior level, a great deal of work with their international um, people from different locations and cultures and taken really good care of them. But that's an example. He will use every podium he can to do that. And that supports the whole, the whole thing. It's taken very seriously as a business issue when that happens. The um, role, if it, your uh, HR role, you've got to, you know, a, a day job, um, it's, it's really important that whoever is responsible for this is reporting into the CEO at the highest, at the highest level that it's taken seriously. Um, tackling diversity at institutional level, touched on this um, on Wednesday in that I pulled out some ways that this, this whole thing can be quite pervasive um, and systemic. Um, the kind of things that I touched on, on briefly on Wednesday was the kind of things that you'd look at to see if you wanted to take a temperature check, how, how well you're doing, how healthy is your organisation. First thing you might want to look at is what kind of hours people are working, the long hours culture thing. Um, and I think this is actually quite fundamental, be, particularly with regard to gender diversity, because that long hours culture prolongs the cycle of dis disadvantage for women, but also men, as you made the point, James, who don't subscribe to this whole masculine way of uh, doing business. And uh, certainly in the research that I've done recently, I've spoken with many men who, in confidence, would tell me they were actively looking for other jobs because of the fact they signed up to an organisation where they thought they'd have work-life balance and would, as fathers, be able to spend time with their young families. Then when they get in there, realise the 40% travel has become 70% travel and they're leaving. They're actively looking for other jobs. And when I say, uh, when I ask them, are you going to disclose that information to the HR department when you do your exit interview. Usually it's A, what exit interview? Uh, and B, uh, even if they asked, I wouldn't tell them. Because it's still socially unacceptable for men to want to have a life outside of, uh, outside of work. And yet we know men want lives outside of work. We know that. We know that. All the research says it. But we don't want to hear it in organisations because we want to push people as far as we can. And men are the easiest people to push because women go and have babies. But that, w as long as we do that, um, men are under increasing pressure. But also women, because they're paid less than men, in dual career families are the ones taking time out to have um, children. That then impacts on their career. They come back in at a lower rung of the ladder, so getting to that top position, even if you wanted to, is even more difficult. And we know that when women take time out to have children also, there's a pension deficit. So there's a shortfall in their older, in their elder years. So they're dependent on men and, and society um, in their later years. And that's a cycle of disadvantage that I think is quite scandalous in our society uh, across the world globally. So there's a key role in HR to spot that and the implications of it, the ramifications of those long hours culture on the people that you're working with. Um, the other kind of things that in terms of institutional um, symptoms that you can pick up on once you switch your radar on again, little things 
you might not notice once you switch your radar on. It's a bit like once you switch your radar on for environmental issues, you notice when someone pushes the big button on the toilet and they flushed it longer than it needed to be. You notice whether something's recycled or not. It's the same with diversity and inclusion. Language. Is there a very macho um, banter in an organisation? Um, I worked with a, a senior HR team just recently in, a very, um, in the energy sector and um, there was only one woman um, on the team. Uh, that's quite interesting in itself because women represent 80% of the HR profession, generally speaking. It's a very female profession, but when you get to the senior positions, it drops to 20%. Uh, that's interesting in itself. Um, but at this, uh, in this environment, um, the, they were, the, the, the population were denying that there were any issues of, of uh, gender or, or, or sex discrimination in the organisation. And at one point, one of the, the guys got very animated and said, uh, uh, somebody made a point, and in response, he stamped his fist on the table and said, that's not very ballsy of you. Um, so, and I think beforehand... And the woman came out afterwards and said, you know, before this whole... But they, they, they speak like that all the time. But I never noticed it before. I just thought, well, they're just a bit... You know, that's how they behave. But she, now she's starting to piece, put the pieces together. And equally, you in your positions, when you hear people use language like that, it's not just a, a throwaway comment. It actually defines the culture of your organisation. When people use language like that, when they behave like that, they are reinforcing a masculine paradigm of business. Um, and, and in HR... You're perfectly, uh, well, it's incumbent on you really to, to be challenging that kind of behaviour. The other thing there, if, you, if, you, if you're serious about challenging cultures and organisations and institutions, then um, for your diversity, uh, as well as setting targets at lower levels, good practice would involve that you're setting targets at higher levels as well. So you're having that conversation with the boardroom that's all white men and saying, look, how do you want to look in five years' time? Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to change our succession planning? What are we going to do to bring in, if we need to, uh, people who are different from outside? So with regard to ethnic diversity, gender diversity, style diversity, people who haven't been to the same school that you've been to, even, you know, things like that. Um... You've, you've already, we've, we've, we've already made the point about marketing um, materials uh, being aligned with the brand and the and values of your organisation. That's crucial because, as you say, Janet, that you communicate your values in the images that you put out and also the people that, that are put in front of you. That communicates the values of your organisation. They have to be aligned. And sometimes you have to be prepared to rein in your marketing department. Um, the recruitment... Again, not going to labour this, job-related competencies. So when you're setting out the kind of person that you want, relate it back to the job uh, rather than your image of what a leader is because then you find yourself coming up with words that reinforce the images that we just saw um, earlier. Um, so make very sure, if we want to be really transparent and fair and be able to put our hands on our heart and say we, we, we're doing this right, we really need to track everything back to what is the job that we're doing here and what are the competences we need. Do we need to state qualifications? Or is that just, oh, we often go into autopilot and just stick out some, you know, degree in, in, in computer marketing, for example, when it might actually, actually not be necessary and maybe there aren't very many women with that qualification. So maybe you don't need the piece of paper. Maybe you should be building in a broader definition of, like, experience in. Um, so again, rethinking who might you be shutting down, who might you be excluding by the, the, the words that you choose. Um, Yeah, we got that point there. Uh, just a case study there. Um, Walmart, um, also Abercrombie and Finch, were both organisations, um, albeit in the US, that uh, uh, came a cropper here. Uh, they were taken to court. Cases taken to court because of, and this is a reflection on HR and HR lessons were learned from it. But the, they were accused, because of the marketing that they used, they were accused of racism um, in the recruitment processes. Their marketing 
the link was made between the images they used in their marketing, which was all white people and white families uh, in their clothing. Uh, Abercrombie and Finch is a clothing um, retail store, like similar to, to Walmart. And it, it became obvious that they were using certain images, and uh, a case was taken that that would impact in recruitment, that the advertising that you use puts people at the same kind of points you were making, will, will, will tell people what the values of your organisation was, and they major um, race cases which was linked back to their recruitment well if, you, if you're doing that in your marketing it's going to impact your recruitment and your recruitment must be um, racist. So that's a case example of how these things can be um, linked. Um, evaluating your managers um, and linking it to re remuneration, that's something that was touched on I, I think yesterday. Absolutely vital. Absolutely vital. In your performance management processes, if you have objectives relating to this, then you have to be able to also hold people account. There will be some people who will be motivated by the objectives or the targets that you set for them around diversity areas, and they will achieve that. There are other people who won't. They just won't get it, or they don't see that it's important. And so what are you going to do about it? Cajoling, motivating them, hit them where it hurts, in the pocket. Yeah. KPIs. I know we talked a little the other night about this. Yeah. So KPIs and targets, because the, the kind of common perception, certainly across Europe, is yeah. that because of positive, positive discrimination legislation, you can't set hard targets for things like the proportion of you know, women in the workforce mm. or disabled or minority. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you had any comment in terms of um, particularly linking it to remuneration. Yeah. What you have found has worked, and what has been um, you know, the right side of the law? Yeah, yeah, the, absolutely. The right side of the law is it's perfectly legal um, to set targets. You set targets for every everything else in your organisation, so why not for diversity and inclusion? Uh, where you'd be fall foul of the law is if you set quotas, and I think that's true also in Australia, isn't it? To set to set quotas is a very different issue. Um, but can you define the difference between a target and a target? Yeah, absolutely. A target is aspirational. So you say, you say for example, um, I want to increase the number of women. Well, Shell have done it. They, they've said a couple of, three years ago they want to increase the number of uh, senior managers, women, senior managers by 20% uh, by 2003. They've missed that three times. No. They set the target, which was deliberately stretching for them at the time because they wanted to raise the bar and they really wanted to do this. Um, sadly, that they failed, um, and, and probably because they're not really looking inside their culture, I think. Um, they're not really going where it needs the, the conversation at the very top to really change the culture from a masculine paradigm to a more inclusive paradigm. So it's still putting women off. But they set a target. Um, and they missed it. And targets are aspirational. We, we sometimes miss them. Um, so that's, you know, it's not ideal and it's embarrassing. But you set it because it's good practice. A quota is non-negotiable. If you set a quota, if Shell had said they want 20% 20 20 increase of women in five years' time, it's non-negotiable. They have to do it. Which would actually mean uh, in their recruitment processes for a senior management position, they would have to exclude men and just allow women to apply for that. So that's, that's very, very different. Mm. Sorry, can I take another question? Yeah. One, one of the real dilemmas we have is in terms of, of, of where that quota, where, sorry, where that target is used as a quota by the manager. What I mean by that is a senior manager who knows that his um, bonus is depend on, on, on sort of getting a particular percentage. Right. Of um, right. You know, his own personal bonus is yeah. I've seen cases where he will appoint, and it's usually a he, he will appoint, um, you know, just to, to, sort of to, to, to meet that quota yeah. um, to, to get the bonus. And, and that's kind of driving the wrong behaviour. Absolutely. So I wonder whether you had a comment in terms of how, mm. you know, in the holistic piece around it, how you drive the right behaviour, yes. the right outcome. Absolutely. But still get the reward in place. Yeah. That's an important motivator. I think, I think you're right. And I think where that happens, and I've seen that happen, you're absolutely right, where it happens more often than not is where there's been a directive from the UK head office saying you've got to meet 
this particular target. And that's seen to be almost, it's, it's positioned as a threat, if you like, or, you know, you'll be judged. It's all about how you position it and how you communicate it. So whoever is responsible for this in the HR department or the diversity department, you go on the ground, have a conversation with this person, make sure they understand why it's important for their part of the business so they buy into it and they understand the whole concept. Where I see that happen and people confusing targets with quotas, they don't understand the, the, di the difference and so they take the shortcuts, they take the short routes um, uh, which is the messy routes and also what it t tends to do a knock-on effect is that is sabotage because it, it communicates it is tokenism uh, and it gives the wrong message and the person who's doing it would often say well I had to meet my, my quota without any understanding of what was behind it. If the person understands that this is actually good for their business, this is what you need, this will enable us to reflect our customers etc. Then it will be a very different, I, I see people approach this in a very different way. They understand the importance of getting it right and not just the crude cutting to the, the, the quota which then sets that minority person whether it's ethnicity or, 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 or gender up to fail. They're going to fail in that environment. Um, so that's how I do it, and it's the role of the H of the person setting this directive is crucial. How you do your business, be inclusive, don't shove things down people's throats, don't make them feel the fear of it, uh, make them feel, understand why it's there, but ultimately, if you're dealing with somebody who isn't going to do it, then they do know what the, the fallback position is. But the other thing there I would uh, say, Janet, is the processes. Uh, check, make sure the processes are in place. The kind of thing David was talking about, the health checks. So that, because uh, if you were operating a quota system, your processes wouldn't be in, in place. You have to follow certain kind of processes. How many people were involved in this interview? Do you all agree? Have you had men come to the interview as well as the women? Has the advertisement gone far and wide? There's certain processes that should be in place that you can check that it isn't positive discrimination, that it has been a transparent, fair system. And that will be really important for the person who's put in that position then to be able to say, actually, this was a level playing field. I got this job because I was good enough for the job. Just, um, just a comment on that, um, what Janet was saying about the bonuses set up there. Yeah. Um, are there any, ever any measures in your terms of turnover? So people go ahead and appoint these people just to make mm -hmm. those particular targets. Then, in fact, what they do is start going through some sort of churn to say, actually, we put them in, we got that, but really they're not the right fit, so let's get rid of them. And so they've got that turnover rate, and they, does that get linked in with perhaps a check and a balance model to actually offset the fact that they put people in and then say, no, okay, we've got the bonus now to get rid of them and move on to the next person? Interestingly, a part of the reason I was asking that question is that I've seen that happen in mm. our it's kind of the issue between a, a quick fix and a systemic fix yeah. because what usually happens um, is that you know, a senior woman gets appointed to meet the, the KPIs, mm -hmm. as we call it, but the other variety of culture, the natural culture, hasn't changed. Has changed. So you know, she, she's there and she's you know, set up to fail. Set up to fail. Yeah. And then it's a self fulfilling prophecy and then we get back into the, well, how do you actually change the whole mindset? Yeah. And it, it's immensely difficult. And I would suggest that that's the reason why Shell is failing constantly, um, because I've, I've worked with uh, you know, people who Shell, and, and the w women will say it's a hugely masculine environment. So all the targets you like to set in the world, all the nice advertisements where you get that right, isn't going to make any difference when a woman is in that environment. She has to behave like a man to survive. What's so? So that's what I mean when I say you have to be prepared to have the difficult conversations. If you want to do this right, you have to have very grown-up conversations with your top team and play back to them that kind of behaviour that you see of stamping your fists on the table and say, oh, hang on a sec, would a woman want to come and sit in this room with you guys behaving like that? Um, and that's bright. it takes courage to do that, but, you know, it needs to be done. Just one final thought, and again, I'm, I'm being very open and sharing my experience here, but what we've also found Exactly. But then what then happens is that they expect other women coming through to get their own the same places. Absolutely. So you get that self perpetuation even absolutely. The, the female manager. Absolutely. That, that's absolutely right. Very often the women that I meet at these senior levels have ma behaviour that's as masculine as men and that's how they survived and that's how they got what they, they got, um, which defeats the whole purpose. And there's a, there's a, there's a 
30% rule apparently if you have anything uh, somebody who's from a minority group less than 30% you're going to uh, so I have to conform to survive. And I've seen that happen time and time again. Um, so it isn't just about the women, it's getting enough women, so you've got to, it, it changes the culture. Um, but it's, it's chicken and egg. Judy, did you want to I say something? I was just going to say, it actually works the other way, having now worked in the not for profit for quite a number of years. The not for profits are notorious for the other way around. They're, they're women driven. They go into the not for profit, <laughs> and the number of men who go into the not for profit sector are minimal. And when you do bring them in, they can't cope because they don't want to work with all these women where the culture is so strongly thin yeah. and bitchy. Um, <laughs> and and I, can, I can absolutely understand why they don't want to work there. Yeah. And equally, the issue is the same. It's, the issue is exactly the same. The issue is the same. Where you've got yep. less than 30% driving the culture. Yep. Those who come in have, have to conform. conform. No. I mean, the first one I worked in, my entire department was women. Yeah. And I was, you know, I've got to get a guy, I've got to get men. Yeah. Uh, the poor young boy I brought in just couldn't. Because they just couldn't. We tried to support him every which way. But a classic all example. The women in the place were constantly treading the path to his door. <laughs> <laughs> a classic example. It was, uh, example it, so it works both ways. Yeah. I want to feel like this is a feminist thing. No, it does, but it, yeah, it just so happens in uh, in, in, in most it, society and business generally tend to be run by a masculine paradigm. But you're right, it can work the other way. Of course, it can, uh, and, and the same challenges apply. Um, uh, statistical monitoring uh, that needs to be in place. If we're serious about it. You need to track who's getting promoted into different positions, and then what if there's a trend, uh, people are dropping out uh, from minority groups. Why? You need to do the pro do a proper analysis. If you don't have your data, you don't have a business case and you can have a serious be expected to be taken seriously in a boardroom if you don't have your data and if you can't have that, that conversation with people um, extended to suppliers that's a point that's already uh, been made who would you give the job to? <laughs> Correct it depends on what the job is but actually of course you're all very sophisticated people in this room. You know that just by looking at somebody's face you can't make a decision about how competent they are or what uh, skills they have. But the reality is, in the press, in the UK press uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a whole piece about how people who are not deemed to be attractive are being discriminated against in job interviews. People who don't have that sort of conform to our subliminal image of what's acceptable are being turned down. They're not even getting past your prejudices, let alone past uh, for you to see their CVs, because you can't see it. You're blinded immediately by your unconscious prejudices. I want to end with one um, exercise. I really want you to, to, to do this, because I believe if we want to do this seriously, and in a role of uh, HR, we need to be able to raise our own levels of self-awareness about what's in our minds that we've carried with us um, from... Sorry, I've got to stay here. Um, from our childhood experience. So I'm going to ask you a, a question, just to think about um, can you think of a time in your life, any time, this does not have to be work-related, any time in your life when you felt in a minority? It could have been any situation. It could have been that you were on the wrong side of a football pitch with the wrong colours on. It could have been that you were the only smoker in a non-smoking um, uh, par dinner party. It could have been that you were abroad somewhere and you couldn't speak the language. Any example that you can think of. When you can think of a time, think of two further things. A. How did it feel? And two, how did you behave differently than you normally would? How did it feel? How did you react in that situation? That you'd probably say, in retrospect, was slightly out of character. When you can think of all of those things, just nod so I know where you are. Okay. So, I'm sorry if... Robin, do you mind sharing with us your, your example? I was just senior HR job. I was um, the only woman in a leadership table of about 10. Um, and it was a not-for-profit. It was actually an emergency service, but very male-dominated. Um, and it was extraordinarily uncomfortable, and I became far more aggressive than that. Right, right. Great example. Thank you, Robin. Anyone else want to share their example? 
Anyone over here? Uh, I'll be someone I guess overseas, Vietnam. Oh, right. Uh, long female in, in Vietnam, you feel completely different to ev everyone else. Um, right. You feel watched with that. Which yeah. Is intimidating in itself. Yeah. And unlike me, I became withdrawn. <laughs> right. You just don't feel like you can be yourself. No. Absolutely. It's not important for us to hear um, all of your examples. What's important is that you all can relate to that. Because can everyone relate to at some time in their life? Anyone not relate to any time in their life when they felt in a minority? Anyone not relate to that at all? Okay. Because actually, uh, most of us, f fortunately, don't go through life feeling like that. They are particular experiences that we can remember because they were, they're, they're ingrained in our mind because they were so powerful. They had such an impact on us. Um, and, and the kind of things that you talked about, feeling different, uh, feeling watched, intimidated, um, marginalised, they're very, very powerful feelings to, to feel and in the negative. They're very often in the negative. Sometimes you can feel good about being in the minority but generally speaking it's, it's negative because if you stand out um, because of something about you that's different you're, there's always a potential of you being uh, the poppy whose head is, is, is um, uh, chopped off. Um, when you can think of a time when you were discriminated against, where you were in a minority or treated in a certain way, it has a huge impact. Um, and I guess for me, in this uh, role, I use this exercise, and I do it in far more detail, and I unpick it, all the different feelings and stuff, with senior executive teams. And it's actually the exercise that has the most impact, interestingly. Once I've done the business case, and they feel safe with me, uh, I've given them the data, we've had the, the conversations, the tough conversations about numbers, how the people are feeling, we've done the business case, they're feeling in their safety zone, then we move into something like this, and boom, that's when you see lights going on and pennies dropping. Um, because you're asking people to empathise with the most vulnerable people in their organisation. All of us can think of at least, and, it, and, it, and if they can't, some of them can't think of a time, any time in their lives when they were in a minority situation. And that, in itself, uh, speaks volumes. And they know that. So if you, you've never ever felt um, marginalised, that you've ever had to defend yourself, that you've ever had to prove yourself, that is in itself very significant and powerful. But by asking people to walk for a mile in other people's shoes and then to say, phew, aren't we lucky? We don't have to feel like this every day. There are people inside of our organisations because of something about them that's different. And it could be anything about them that's different. We can get singled out and picked on, bullied, harassed. And there are people because they're visibly different, they're exposed to that every single day of their lives. And what I try and instill in good managers, yes, let's look at all those processes. Let's look at all those things I had in the previous slide. Great. But first of all, where you start is looking at yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself the question, what baggage do I carry with me into this crucial role? Because my role gives me power. I make decisions about other people's lives. What unconscious biases and prejudices might I be carrying into my job that impacts people who are most vulnerable in my organisation, who will alienate them and compound their sense of um, vulnerability? I've got to end there. Um, I could have gone on for much longer, but I'm really grateful. Thank you all very much for being so interactive, and your experiences have been brilliant. It's been a pleasure being with you this morning. Many thanks.